Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for this National Arts Club program. My name is Nina Urban with the Fashion Committee. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the National Arts Club, we are a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster and promote public interest in the arts and to educate the American people in the fine arts. Annually, the club offers more than 150 free programs to the public, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures and readings. For more information about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org or find us on Facebook, Instagram, X and YouTube. Following this conversation will be a brief Q&A, so please feel free to use the Q&A function for any questions you might have. It is my pleasure to welcome uh, Gwenda Lynn Greval as our guest for this program on philosophy and fashion. Let me tell you about her. Uh, Gwenda Lynn Greval is the Onassis Lecturer in Ancient Greek Thoughts and Language at the New School for Social Research. Her publications include Fashion Sense on Philosophy and Fashion, published in 2022, Thinking of Death in Plato's Euthydemus, a Close Reading and New Translations by Oxford University Press, a translation of Plato's Phaedo, and a forthcoming translation of Plato's Cratylus. She occasionally writes about pop culture as well, most recently for a public seminar on the Barbie movie. She has won several awards, including the Blegen Research Fellowship at Vassar College, and Andrew W. Mellon Postdoctoral Fellowship at Yale University. She has had visiting scholar positions at Harvard University, the Center for Hellenic Studies, and the American Academy in Rome. She also owns the whimsical clothing line, Hardly Alice. Welcome, uh, Gwenda Lynn. We look forward to hearing about philosophy and fashion. Hi, thank you, Nina, and thanks to the National Arts Club for having me. Um, I am going to uh, just make a few remarks um, about my book that Nina just mentioned, um, Fashion Sense, uh, and um, then we can have a little chat. So um, let me start like this. Um, it's a question, I think, why fashion has such a bad reputation not only among intellectuals, but the word fashion in general, I think, drums up thoughts of vanity, consumerism, femininity, sophistry, superficiality, and charlatanism. Certainly when you hear the word fashion, you don't think philosophy, but philosophy sometimes gets a bad rap for being idle and useless, the very things that might be considered fashion's crimes. In Aristophanes' Clouds, Socrates appears as an airhead, floating into the clouds in a basket. Socrates, in case you don't know, um, is also very ugly. In fact, so ugly that when the clouds look at him, they take on the shape, shapes of monsters and animals. In other words, Socrates is so ugly, you can't even see it on his face. You need the clothing of the clouds to get the gist of what a troll he really is. It's going to be along these lines that I want to say that fashion is less about what we see and more about what we don't see. Fashion is not really about the surface. The surface is like a metaphor we miss the first time we see it. How could we crack its depth when it is precisely the thing that lacks depth? To notice the surface, we have to have already seen past it. Thoughts about the superficial therefore produce both its rejection as insignificant and the obsession with it as something impregnable. Simone de Beauvoir, I think, captures the irony nicely. In an interview with The Observer in 1960, um, and if you're curious, you can find this online, it's reprinted in The Guardian. Beauvoir is sitting dressed impeccably in red tweed, and she's wearing a matching shade of bright red lipstick. She utters the following words. I must tell you, I'm not at all interested in clothes. 
So my question is, why the errors? Why the need to broadcast on the surface a disregard for the surface? It's as if intellectuals are afraid that by appearing to care about fashion, they might be suddenly doused in sins of shallowness or worse, deceit, even though to really believe that would be to give appearance the power of reality. Serious thinkers try to stay out of charm's way. They must look dowdy and unmoved, their prose wooden, prudishly layered with citations. In the early 1990s, two articles were published in America by Valerie Steele and Karen Hansen about the fear of fashion in academia. In Steele's article, which was ceremoniously entitled The F Word, she writes, quote, clothes are a taboo subject, a forbidden realm of pleasure. Many of the very same professors who censoriously dismiss the pleasures of dress may well lavish time and money on couture cuisine, stereos, volvos, computer gadgetry, skis, travel, and wine, but not clothes. The words still ring true. Now, I feel I need to pause here just so that you don't get the wrong idea. I'm not planning to give uh, philosophical advice about fashion. I don't really care what academics um, or really what anybody uh, wears, nor am I interested in the lame subfield that gets popular these days called philosophy of fashion, as if fashion were one of a number of things philosophy could discuss. Instead, the premise of my book is a much more ludicrous and radical claim, the claim that fashion and philosophy are a pair of estranged twins, the two of them running parallel to one another, so much you might begin to think that they're the same thing. In the 19th century, Thomas Carlyle wrote a satirical novel called Sartor was Artis, or The Tailor Retailored, in which the editor, who is a kind of metaphorical tailor, wonders why there has not yet been a philosophy of clothes. The joke is that philosophy, in peeling back the surface to get to the bottom of things, has missed the surface entirely. Every layer that it peels off reveals more surfaces to peel, and not just philosophers, but also scientists have missed that it is clothing all the way down. Fashion in this way rivals, even mocks philosophy, as if to dare it to prove that its inquiry were not in the end a superficial shroud for its own ignorance. If only there were a theory for every example, as an outfit for every occasion. If only the truth could be hit upon like the chance harmony of a good hair day. The so-called ancient quarrel between philosophy and poetry that Plato speaks of in the Republic might be thus retold as a quarrel between philosophy and fashion. The trope is that philosophy isn't into adorning, but rather stripping and laying bare. To look at the truth, you must look at it truthfully, which is to say, you must be wearing a look that is pared down to its most nude or neutral fashion. You must strip off your rose-colored glasses and all that, or at least acknowledge you're wearing them. You must be at leisure too, so you aren't swayed in one fashion more than another, precisely the kind of seduction that fashion, and poetry for that matter, is so good at. The trouble is just that this neutral look has its own allure. The cynics used to wear the same sort of garb that hot shots in Silicon Valley now do, deliberately dressing down in the ancient equivalent of hoodies and flip-flops. Diogenes Laertius tells a story about Socrates seeing Antisthenes reveal a hole in his jacket. I see your love of reputation in the tear in your cloak, Socrates remarks. Antisthenes threadbare habit is designed to make us think he's giving it to us straight. But isn't this shabby chic the very height of a lie? Or is it that you can only tell the truth through disguise? Why does reflection have to look like a shrew? The truth needs some sort of visual cue and honesty is apparently unsightly. Self-consciousness grates against our outward expressions, whether outfits, words, or glances. Praise for how we put our outfits together is not so much a praise of our clothes as it is the praise of our intelligence, looking smart in a double sense. Keeping up appearances ambiguously means remaining composed, pointing not to what you see, but to the agent that you don't see though ironically clothes last longer than their wearers do. The issue is time, swaddled in thoughts of material and death. Now death is probably not uh, the word that springs to mind when you're getting dressed in the morning, though we do have a phrase, I wouldn't be caught dead in it. The thread is that what we're wearing might become something we have to wear forever, an eternal memorial to our existence, a thought we're buried in. 
fashioning ourselves means reckoning with our own oblivion. And by and large, the rumors about fashion's fickleness seem to come from its constant motion. What exactly is fashion? Can it even be an is? Its peripheral perfume seems still unbottled. Is fashion the ruffle or the way the ruffle hangs? Or is it the way the ruffle moves when it's on a specific body? Its attitude, which is very closely related to the attitude of the person who wears it. Fashion traces a silhouette, drawing you in with its tone, its cadence, with a pattern that isn't just static but unfolds in motion, which is to say, as time passes, as fashion is in the process of being worn. And the more you look for the fashion in the outfit, the more it begins to disappear behind the fabric, even to bleed into the very words you use to describe it. Fashion is the air of certainty with which someone delivers an argument, the snoot of erudition that makes another feel foolish, the turn of phrase that solidifies conviction, the tilt of a hat, the point of a hot poker. But this is part of the worry about fashion. Its force seems somehow illegitimate, entering in as it seems to do from the outside and invading everything in the near vicinity, like an adverb that permeates an entire sentence. Fashion itself has words for glossing the whimsy of its own trends. It speaks of quote unquote basics, necessities, must haves, essentials. And even in its most exaggerated appearances, it seems to aim at striking a pose of perfectly necessitated contingency. Once this was signified by effortless elegance, but now it comes out in casual looks like quiet luxury, athleisure, carefully worn sneakers and stylishly washed sweatpants, bedhead, normcore, even fashion that markets itself as conscious of its own faults. This is fashion that apologizes for appearing as fashion at all. Don't judge me, plain clothes seem to say, as if they were neutral, unbiased observations. That fashion wishes to arrive in style, not just with randomness, but with nonchalant necessity, comes out in phrases like, maybe she's born with it, or how becoming, as if a state of coming to be were equivalent to a state of being. Is there a moment in our lives and in our clothes where the self emerges in its prime, neither too old nor too young, but Botoxed into some kind of eternal icon? On the flip side, there are phrases like, I just woke up like this, which is like saying, I am this way by pure chance, not by design. It is highly unfashionable to look like you care too much about how you look. That's so you, we sometimes say of clothing, as if you were a standard that everyone but you could see. What exactly is meant by this you? Is the you who wears clothes the body? Body, too, is spoken of as if it were an outfit that you could wash, shape, style, and feel more or less comfortable in. Now, comfort is something that I think we should discuss, um, and I'm going to say a few words about it at the moment, and then maybe we can pick it up um, in the discussion. In the 19th century in London, there was a society called the Rational Dress Society, which protested against clothing that was too constrictive. Rational dress was pro-comfort and anti-constraint. Now, the metaphor there, I think, is easy to see. And in my book, I talk about things like prison uniforms, sumptuary laws, and dress codes. But I want to focus now on the armor of leisure. Comfortable clothes are supposed to offer the freedom to relax and be at home in fabric that breathes. The point of comfortable clothes is to forget you are in clothes, as we do in comfortable patterns of thought. Comfort is as much a look as it is a feeling. It looks casual, not contrived, not overdone. A safe space in which we can ward off feelings of binding or provocation in ourselves as wearers or in others as onlookers, as if clothes were the sign that we are somehow fundamentally uncomfortable. Is it through the touch of fabric on our skin that an awareness of ourselves as fleeting arises, an awareness that we are uncomfortably trapped in perception, which is again to say, in time. Athleisure takes this up a notch by suspending its wearers in a fleeting state. And for those of you that don't know what athleisure is, um, although I'm pretty sure that probably everybody knows, um, 
athleisure is the wearing of gym clothes but not to the gym so on a regular basis you know um you're going to the store you're going uh to a soccer game you're uh you're even going to school and what are you wearing gym clothes gym clothes i think are not yet clothes they're on their way to being clothes they fix the wearer in the moment of passing from one outfit to the next Done correctly, athleisure is like those sculptures for which Polyclitus was famous, displaying the body caught off duty in a moment of pure transition, a natural motion suspended from here to there, a leisure wear ironically called performance wear. Why wear your gym clothes 24 seven? Because you're not defined by practical matters, deadlines and pushups. Here in athleisure, one finds fashion engrossed in the moment, not so much because it is fickle, but because the momentary somehow transcends time's march. So the point is this, despite its usual associations with embodiment, I think fashion deals in the much crazier notion of wishing to transcend the body altogether. Fashion moves through facsimiles, trying to expose some inward dimension that defies articulation and for which material seems to be only an image. This absurd feature of fashion is one that's shared by thinking and speaking, and it deserves being underlined. Clothes and words are able to be worn and uttered by wearers and speakers, either in homage or mockery. How strange it is that clothes can always be removed and yet also make impressions that stick almost impermeably to the person. This any seventh grader knows, which is why it's so odd that academics ignore fashion. People are buried, not naked, but in clothes. When we think of our friends, we imagine them in one or another outfit as we remember certain things that they said. And yet, most of us don't actually know who made our clothes or which authors we're quoting with our various designs. Even citing brand names doesn't repay the debt of agency expressed by the strangeness of clothes on the body. This is a perpetual disjunction of the self with itself that comfortable clothes seem intent on resolving. Superficiality in this way, I think, makes good sense. How great would it be to be two-dimensional? If you didn't have an inside, or if your inside were on the outside, this would mean being visible not as a mere appearance, but rather as a complete reality. To be weightless, without gravity, depth, or the need for clarification. I've often wished to be thoughtless for similar reasons. Fashion thus starts to eclipse the very words I'm using to express it. What are these strange fibers of reflections with which I lace together a corset of understanding? I bury in revelatory cloth that aspect of my words that seems always to deviate from my grasp, yet fashion is in the grasp itself, and the wish to be either outside of it or wholly immersed in it can only be consummated by death or infinite life. What then of the claim that fashion is modern? To ascribe a beginning point to fashion seems to require positing a time in which clothes were naked of fashion a time when time did not discomfort us and all clothes were simply leisure wear. Imagining such a pre-fashion moment is a problem of thinking and it reveals a relationship between fashion and thinking. If there was a faultless, unfashioned origin, perhaps there can be a future cured of humanity's failed fashions. Does fashion, especially fashion that pretends to be no fashion, in some way signify a longing to control fate? Fashion progresses, however ironically, toward the perfect age and the perfect outfit, even in fashion photography, the perfect shot of the perfect look. This is an effortless presentation of perfection that mirrors the mythical state wherein fashion was once effortlessly absent or present without our having before noticed it. Here again, non-believers in fashion find themselves coveting the same reality as those who worship it. And it's to this that I wanna turn for the rest of my remarks. So I wanna think about this comment that is often, um, it's often delivered in, in praise of a, of a person's ability to take on any outfit. So it's a form of flattery to say to somebody, you could really wear anything. Um, and I think what's sort of hiding in that is this uh, is this assumption that being able to wear anything is like a kind of liberation from the constraints of fashion, but also it's total perfection. 
So being like a model, which either means being a paradigm or being a copy. Athens had the same thought way back in the 5th century BCE. Thucydides uses the word tropos, which gives us the word trope and literally means turn, um, but also fashion. He uses that word to refer to a critical change in Athenian dress. The Athenians gave up their golden cricket clips and linen underwear to take on the more modest dress of the Spartans. Now, um, in case you don't know, the golden uh, the golden crickets or cicadas um, uh, and the sort of luxury of, of wearing linen underwear, these were all the signs of like the old Athenian um, elite and crickets because the Athenians thought they were like cicadas that hatched from the earth. So they got rid of all that and they took on the more modest dress of the Spartans. That dress included the fashion of exercising naked, a sign not of Athenian rusticity, but rather of Athenian refinement, of their stripping off the need for any specific convention or outfit. While this seems like a metaphor for democracy, Alcibiades was the model. He changed his allegiances as if they were daily fashions, allying himself with Athens, then Sparta, then Persia, his identity a poetic chameleon, not settling for any one look, but taking each one on and leading us to the question, who really was Alcibiades? It was after Alcibiades that the 19th century dandies styled themselves. Now, I don't mean dandy here in the contemporary sense. These days we use the word to mean a sort of flamboyantly clothed person, um, an ostentatious person. But the 19th century meaning of dandy is something more like an authentic fraud a social climber without any attachments, someone who's dressed so impeccably you don't even notice them. The dandy's cool and elegant air so perfects the social dress code that he or she or neither, since the dandy is genderless, seems to betray its arbitrary character in a single stroke of talentless genius. The dandy is chance incarnate and his worship of the toilet a sacred joke. With nothing to lose and nothing to offer, the dandy is the ultimate accessory to every royal court, even a rival to royalty, as was the case with Beau Brummel and the Prince of Wales. Gandhi, by the way, was also a dandy in his early life. As a student in London, he wrote about his preoccupation with the look of the British gentleman, his love of neckties, and his having succumbed to the quote-unquote fashion goddess. Gandhi's choice to use a hand-spun garment as a political statement does not seem to have been an accident. Gandhi wore his flag, the symbol of a spinning wheel, which became for a time the symbol on India's flag. Fashion now begins to seem more daring in its fancy. Its fabric can drug you, only to rebel against its very own poison, like how hipsters put lumberjack in a mason jar and made it ironic. Times of revolution, wrote Marx, moved by conjuring up past spirits and costumes. Benjamin alludes to this when he refers to fashion as a, quote, tiger's leap into the past. That is not a whimsical aimless leap, but a leap that is on the hunt. What is fashion hunting? Benjamin says fashion is, quote, keeping to the scent of the now in the thicket of the once. With a simple change of hats, fashion can move ideas across time in a way that seems to smirk at historical con context. Being hip is like being a revolutionary, bringing what is out back in at a critical moment. This is sort of, you know, a great example of this is, of course, the novelty of the vintage scene. The more obscure something is, the riper it is for a renaissance. And now I want to um, I want to sort of move to to two um, unlikely stories from the past. Uh, one concerns uh, Niccolo Machiavelli. So uh, on the 10th of December in 1513, Machiavelli was writing a letter to Francesco Vittori describing a day in his life. This is one of the most famous um, letters ever written. And he writes, quote, when evening has come, I return to my house and go into my study. At the door, I take off my clothes of the day, covered with mud and mire, and I put on my regal, that's reali in Italian, and courtly garments, and decently reclothed, I enter the ancient courts of ancient men, where received by them lovingly, I feed on the food that alone is mine and that I was born for. There, I am not ashamed to speak with them and to ask them the reason for their actions, and they in their humanity reply to me. 
And for the space of four hours, I feel no boredom. I forget every pain. I do not fear poverty. Death does not frighten me. I deliver myself entirely to them. Now, earlier in the letter, Machiavelli had described how he got his clothes dirty. He'd been out catching thrushes and reading Dante, Petrarch, Tibullus, and Ovid. He sheds his muddy clothes to read alone in his study. Um, and just as a side note, I say, you know, um, I suspect that this must mean that he's not reading any more Italians or Romans, but rather Greeks. Reclothed in regal and courtly garments, his finest exterior will apparently beget his finest thoughts, and he won't be embarrassed to converse with the dead. The Italian word for regal or royal, reale, is a pun, I think, on reale, the word for real. The courts of the ancients are the courts of dead men, for which it is necessary to look real, perhaps in the sense of true. This does not mean removing your clothes, but rather wearing the clothes of reality or royalty. In these new clothes, Machiavelli becomes more himself. Time ceases to matter. He's not afraid of death, pain, or poverty. Behind closed doors, buried in books and fine robes, Machiavelli disappears from view and communes with shadows. This is a poetic nudity, as if to be seen somehow meant to be unseen. Now, no character in antiquity better captures that sentiment that to be seen is somehow to be unseen than Polytropos Odysseus, a man quite literally of many fashions. Throughout the Odyssey, Odysseus composes stories just as Homer does to try to convince people that he's not who he actually is. In his most notorious trick, Odysseus tells the Cyclops, Polyphemus, that he is, quote unquote, no one which is later revealed in Greek as a pun on the word for mind. So the words in Greek are utis, no one, and metis, which means mind, but also doubles as a, another alternative um, for no one. When Odysseus realizes the ambiguity, he delights in it and cannot help but yell back to the Cyclops as he's sailing away that no one is in fact Odysseus. Odysseus wants to be known for being unknown, for being able to take on any outfit, when he finally arrives back in Ithaca, the same longing comes out in his disguise as a beggar, a literal nobody. The suitors that have been plundering his house do not yet know who he is. But again, he demands that they recognize his unrecognizable presence. Only gods behave in this way, and that proves to be not only Odysseus's problem, but I think also the problem of fashion and philosophy. And the problem, um, just to restate it now uh, in a sort of more um, direct way, is I think this. If to see the world perfectly means to disappear, is to be seen perfectly to appear as no one? Is fashion driving toward what philosophy is unwittingly compelled to posit? What that is, I think, is this vantage point of performative non-identity, the fantasy that there is a naked self behind our clothes. How does one see Odysseus behind Odysseus's fashions? Recognition requires that a sign come from within. Yet such a sign could not be exposed on the surface without transforming it into a possible forgery. In clothes, we notice that the surface is not everything. This makes possible both the thought of their deceit, but also the thought of an inside. Concealment and revelation are likewise present in fashion's phantom play and in its potential metaphor. In Greek, there's a word cosmos, which we have in English, so you probably um, already have a sense of, of what it might mean. Um, and in Greek, it has the same meaning that it does uh, in English, which is obvious universe um, or world really literally beautiful order. But in Greek, it can also mean dress um, and is very often used in this way, um, sometimes to mean the whole outfit. Uh, so the beautiful order of an, of an outfit as it's composed um, or like a jewel and an adornment of some kind that's on top of an outfit. So sometimes the stars get referred to as cosmoi, which means jewels uh, in that context. And the word cosmos gives us two words uh, that might not seem at first as if they go together, cosmic uh, and cosmetic. 
at once referring to what adorns a whole and to the whole itself, the accident of the fringe and the necessity of the order. That the two coexist in one word might seem absurd, but consider a remark made by Aristotle in the Poetics. The most amazing things that happen by chance seem as if they happen by design. And the design of chance? Well, this is the knack of great writers and designers, the skill of getting things just right. Just right means necessarily by accident, tailor-made to caprice, the sprezzatura of, I meant to do that, and it wasn't me. Like poetry, fashion notices and is very skilled at engineering seemingly insignificant details that scream the agency of no one. The little stitch that alters the draping and sew the mood, the extra pleat that trims the balance, the punctuation mark that knots the reader's spell. Such notes are fashion's wits, metaphors, I think, for what is incalculable, what we can never control, no matter how much we straitjacket our prose. Meaning longs for clothes that suit it and yet which threaten to disguise it. It dresses itself as it is undressing. There's something uncomfortable about the fit, something not quite right, which evades expression. With despair and delight, we try to grasp what's underneath in uncertain terms, in parody, in earnest, in ways and words that must elude if they're there to continue to mean. Perhaps fashion does turn life into a house of mirrors, but it cannot do it without at the same time revealing something more. The surface is the place of reflection from which the groundless magic of meaning springs out. It is, I think, the sign of everything deep. Now, um, I don't know, uh, Nina, are you there? I'm here. Okay, do you, do you yep. wanna, <laughs> I, can, I can do one of two. I can say a little bit more about about that place of ending, you know, that I think the surface is in this this strange and interesting way, the sign of everything deep. Um, or I can turn it over to you and let you throw me uh, a question. I think, um, why don't you tell us more about, uh, you know, the ending? Okay. Um, so the ending sort of means to go back to the place where I began, which is, um, which is this thought of, the surface as in a way the most difficult thing in the world to understand because in order to even see it you have to miss it because otherwise we wouldn't know you know um that it was a surface things which are completely surface wouldn't even have this um this experience that there could be something beyond them and so i think hiding in this thought that um that often leads to the disparaging of fashion the thought that you know the surface is a place of vanity Lurking in that thought is actually, um, is actually, I think, a redemption of the surface as always pointing to something more. And so I think it's the fact that we can experience the surface at all that makes possible this thought of meaning, which is the thought uh, of depth. And so, you know, in a way, fashion is, is uh, everything. <laughs> Not a thought. I, I I think that's a, a wonderful summary. Uh, let me see. I have an image here too. Um, I think that's a wonderful summary, really, uh, of of the question we all ask ourselves: um, Is fashion good or bad? If we posit that philosophy has the right to decide that, uh, um, my first question is: um, As an intellectual yourself, how did you become interested in this topic? Uh. That's a, it's a um, it's a good story I I suppose um, so I had been I I had been for a long time pretty interested in fashion just as a kind of mode of of adornment but not in any sort of super intellectual way um, and I'd gotten this postdoctoral fellowship uh, at Yale and I was supposed to be working on Plato um, and I started to become sort of fascinated by this way in which uh, academics um, or intellectuals more generally sort of bristle at the sign that anybody cares about the surface. And yet they're sort of obsessed with the image of looking like they care about depth. And that comes out through, you know, their 
bibliographies, their briefcases, their tweed, their sort of, you know, um, stodgy looks that are supposed to say, I don't care about the way that I look. Um, so I started to think about that and it led me uh, down this rabbit hole um, very far away from what I was originally, uh, what I was originally supposed to be doing. Um, and and like some 15 years later, I produced this <laughs> this crazy book. <laughs> Um, I, I um, by the way, I recommend for everyone to get the book. There's uh, so many more um, interesting examples and stories, of course, that um, we could only really touch upon. Um, so, in a sense, you're saying that um, fashion itself is—I mean, philosophy itself is fashion, and vice versa. And to ignore uh, the philosophical aspects of fashion, that at its core really has. Um, to define and transcend identity and thus the really the the core of human experience um would you say is is short-sighted is this a criticism of um, your philosopher colleagues uh yes in in, in some sense i mean um in the book i i i dive more spiritedly into the ways in which philosophy actually is very interested in in the surface um so phenomenology is in a way all about you know um the way that things appear the phenomena um literally um in greek uh the things which appear um and so there are you know all sorts of ways in which my criticism is really you know a bit campy it's not it's not quite right um but there's something true about it and the sort of more ordinary version of it, I think, is this tendency um, that we have to discount the things that are right in front of our faces. Um, and yet, you know, it's it's those things that, like I was saying, are, are both the hardest to understand and the things through which in seeing past them, we see everything else. So, so yes, it's a critique, but it's, it's not a, it's not a strong critique. And, and um, like I mentioned, I'm not my my interest, you know, while well motivated by the things I saw around me that that academics were were doing became so much more uh, robust when I started to think about just how interesting the question of fashion really is. I saw actually a funny um, a funny thing. Um, I'm reading the 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 Q and A. I didn't see it because I was. I was talking, um, and there's a question about whether I'm going to be sharing visuals. And the thing is, I did, I had some visuals, um, and there were some issues with with them in terms of copyright. But I also sort of started to think that philosophically, like my my whole premise is that there's something about fashion which is not visual, which you can't see, which sort of requires that you you look past the things that you um, that you see in order to see this phenomenon. Um, of of what's uh of what an image is um and so then i started to to be very delighted with the fact that i didn't have, <laughs> have any visuals um but i know sometimes we're, it's yeah. easier to have them on zoom we are not in luck alas um can you describe some images that you would have uh used for illustrating uh for example i'm i'm personally very curious to hear if there were uh, any fashion icons as it were in ancient greece Oh, well, I mean, Socrates is like the classic fashion icon, you know, because he made ugliness sexy. I mean, there's no more, more like <laughs> sexy trope in antiquity than the absent minded, hideous philosopher. Um, on the one hand, you know, a uh, certain image you sort of recoil at. And on the other hand, you know, there's this, this story I told about Antisthenes who uses his own unraveling as a metaphor for um for the fact that he cares so much about uh about things which are not um material so definitely socrates um also alcibiades who i'm i mentioned um Bo brummel so the the kind of image of the dandy as this this figure that slides through a social order but doesn't really quote unquote belong there and therefore reveals this way in which belonging is you know um is uh in a certain way, way um more about about surfaces than um than about uh than about who you really are so the dandy is is a great kind of figure of of 
revolution because the dandy is able to insert himself into these situations where he doesn't fit um and upsets you know the the way that things are supposed to be supposed to be ordered so there was Beau Bremel there was the the image that I described of Simone de Beauvoir in her beautiful red tweed suit with her beautiful um red lipstick uh there was let me think who else there was Gandhi in his fancy um early uh law school attire um there were many things <laughs> thank you Gandhi is an a, an interesting example and seems like you know both extreme and paradigmatic perhaps for the philosopher who renounces uh fashion in this out of um, perhaps, well, a sense of moral or intellectual obligation. And yet uh, he was actually a fashionista himself. Right, are right. Are there other examples where, um, well, an, a different choice of perhaps more austere fashion uh, was seen as uh, ever a revolutionary or important um, moral societal statement? Right. I mean, so many. <laughs> um, and I mean, particularly the look of austerity, I mean, and and fascism, there's a lot there uh, there that one one could say. I mean, uh, the reason I I singled out Gandhi is because um, not just because of the the stuff he wrote about his own love of fashion, but also because the symbolic use of fashion, which is simultaneously, you know, a rejection of fashion, but also the employment of it um, for this this greater aim where fashion suddenly becomes not about uh, material, but about the image of um, cloth as a metaphor for a symbol as such that can unite people. Um, so that's why I picked it, because I think it has this um, this neat way of sort of tying to what flags do uh, more generally. Um, they're fashion, too. Yeah. So it seems fashion. Um, well, what is fashion versus style, for example? Um, in all your examples, it appears ultimately fashion is, in fact, something uh, not at all bound to the surface or the material, but something that transcends because uh, at its core, the purpose is uh, conveying some form of identity. Uh, right. How about style? What? What? Uh, how would you define the the two different? Um, right. So um, one yeah. of the one of the things that um, that my book uh, tries to do is to say that style is just um, you know fashion in, in masquerade. <laughs> I mean, style is a thing. So while philosophers don't they don't like to talk about fashion they hate this word they sometimes will talk about style because it sounds like it's more serious like it's something you know when we think of style we think of something more more uh that has more longevity that has more gravity that could repeat itself in various instances without just sort of you know reincarnating into a whole new um a whole new trend um, so style sort of gives you the impression that that fashion, you know, um, isn't running the show. Um, and what I think is that fashion is nonetheless still running the show, because the strangest thing about fashion is that it puts itself forward towards this image that would be like a perfectly complete, you know, um, styled outfit um, and that would be just right. Uh, and then, you know, it has all these words of that uh, that seem like they'd apply more to style than to fashion, basics, necessities, essentials. Um, so I kind of don't see the dis the disparity as much as I think um, many people have articulated it. Uh, yes. Um, I think you say, you know, in your book, the difference uh, between fashion and style could perhaps be conceived as timely versus timeless. Um, you know, so styles are things that come back, or that are all that are universally relevant. Fashions come and go, even though they tend to be reinvented. But um, do you think that uh, respect for style, as it were, 
among philosophers uh, or other intellectuals, uh, perhaps self-styled intellectuals, has to do more with the fact that style appears to be something that is under our conscious control while fashion comes and goes uh, and we you know, may fall prey. Uh, there are many right. monikers. We may become fashion victims and that's usually have, has negative connotations. Right, right, right. Um, right. The, right. Interesting. Um, interesting. The place that you started, the thing that that I say in my book about the timeless and the timely, um, I think is interesting because an interesting place to start my answer. Because part of what I was trying to convey in these remarks I just made is that there's something about the timely that when it strikes a perfect note of being of the moment, tries to transcend time in the same way that I think style wants to do and 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 would do, you know, if it could if it could do this thing that it that it sets out um, for itself. So the the sort of short answer to the latter part of the question is, yes, that seems interesting, like an interesting way to think about how fashion can sink its its prongs into you and you somehow can't control it but style is like conscious fashion and there's a way in which you're more aware of it um and yet i think you know fashion's sort of ultimate moment is this complete awareness that strikes the perfect pose which looks as if on the one hand it's all about the timely and on the other hand um looks as if it tries to to take itself out of time which is why, you know, I'm so interested in athleisure because <laughs> athleisure is like this sort of perfect, I didn't, I didn't give you the image. Um, this was again in my, in my visuals of the Polycleitean statue, which is sort of perfectly suspended. It's like perfect athleisure from one motion to the next. And so it just has this look of like being in transition. Um, and and that's what I think, you know, um, athleisure tries to do. You also say, um, well, can you actually speak a little more to the image of comfort in clothing? Uh, you know, that's very nice to to get more descriptions of would be visuals. <laughs> so uh, bring keep them keep them coming. Um, but for example, you say uh, comfort has become the reigning doctrine in both clothing and thinking in America. Right. Um, Right. What I mean, um, I've been thinking a lot about that lately because my my new um, my new project concerns um, Odysseus, which which is why he made a he made a cameo um, in here. Uh, and I've sort of been yeah I've been thinking about the way in which um, comfort sort of yeah it's like a a doctrine that inheres both in the way that we think about um fashion and how it how it could come to be at home on our persons without making us feel like we were participating in something we don't want to participate in or um forcing us to consider you know the fact that we appear um in real life and i think the way in which we think about engagement in other forms of expression speech um thought and and the freedom surrounding those those things is likewise in a way being governed at the current moment by comfort what you know um what uh is not triggering what is a sort of um safe space where we don't have to have so much grading against you know the things that we might feel um uncomfortable with uh something which i sort of um which i think i uh, um is is not so good <laughs> because right. if you follow my argument about you know the sort of positive thing about fashion is that it it shows you you know that meaning is never able to be perfectly at home in this way because the way that you get meaning is always through a kind of packaging it's never expressed quite right um and so this longing for transparency in speech and in clothes i think is mirroring they're mirroring one another in an interesting way yes uh, yeah, I've always seen the rise of athleisure and comfort wear as um, uh, daunting <laughs> and foreboding. Yes, yeah. uh, I agree. Um, let's go to a few questions from the audience. Um, 
There's one here. Um, do you have a favorite fashionista in history? Uh, good question. Um, do I have a favorite fashion? Well, I mean, again, my whole thing is that the sort of philosophy and fashion are like these estranged twins, you know, separated at birth and yet somehow mirroring one another. So is that separate from my, who is my favorite philosopher? Or is it the same question? Um, I would say Plato. <laughs> who's fam famously says um, in one of his letters, which people doubt whether or not these letters are are um, are really Plato's uh, voice, but let's just assume that they are. Um, but in one of the letters, he talks about dressing Socrates up and beautifying him. Um, and so he he's sort of describing a kind of poetic activity, um, his philosophical mode of writing dialogues and dressing up Socrates' character, sort of turning his ugliness sexy. Um, and I I find that attractive. I like I like Plato as a fashionista. <laughs> That's wonderful. Um it seems like you're well you're pointing out or you have been pointing out the importance of the surface. Would it be up to say your position is something like, you know, to summarize this once again, we can't get deeper without taking into account the surface and what is beneath the surface is go only going to appear in a way conditioned by the appearance on its surface. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. so. Um, and in a way, not a, you know, um, I mean, the way that you just said it, which was perfect, um, but also prescriptive. I think it's not just the way that, that we, um, that we can't, that we sort of shouldn't disregard the surface, but also that that we actually don't. If you just look at the way that that people engage, I mean, this idea that fashion should be about you know um, about what you see right in front of you is such a, um, a um, such a red herring when you start to really think about it. Um, that I think actually the way that people um, do in fact engage with each other is through clothes um, and in a very real way, not in a, um, not in a fraudulent way. Right. Um, you know, I, as you said, fashion is really, I mean, fashion is a form of self-expression just like um, other art forms or communication in, in general. Um, right. Do you think how... However, this is another question. Uh, designers and people interested in fashion are usually consciously aware of these ideas. Not always. <laughs> and for, probably for the most part, no. Um, no, and this is something sort of that I that I am interested in thinking about, you know, because essentially what I've said is philosophers sort of don't think about fashion, but fashion kind of thinks like whether or not the person that's using fashion knows it or not, the fashion sort of has these thoughts baked within it. And so even if you, you know, um, don't notice that it's thinking, um, it really is sort of um, a thing that looks as if it's tied to awareness. So even if, you know, it's not the case that every designer has sort of philosophical um, thoughts in mind, it is the case that I think every, you know, um, every piece of of fashion has within it an invitation to think more deeply about it, sort of like art in that way. I mean, not everybody is engaging with art in this way that's hyper aware of all the intentions of the artists. And yet, you know, they're sort of, as a beautiful surface, it contains the invitation to think more deeply about, um, about it. I think that's wonderfully put. Um... And how would you def define or how would you describe your fashion philosophy? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> or your style. A terrifying question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I, one of the things that, that I do think is actually kind of um, wonderful about, about fashion in this sense, um, you know, where it's sort of, liberated from uh well let me let me start over um i like the idea that everything that's put forward 
is put forward in a certain way. And that way is like a really fun, fun place to play with things and think about them, not just in terms of, you know, the way you wear, um, wear something, which, you know, two people wearing the same thing never looks, never looks the same. Um, but also the way in which, you know, sort of words can be continually um, edited in terms of their tone, the way they're delivered. Um, so I, I think about, you know, my, my own style in that way. I get inspiration from everywhere. I, I love all sorts of, you know, styles. I like thinking about the potential um, in every expression. Um, it's sort of, yeah, it's, um, I like wondering about, about, you know, um, how things might look if put in a different way. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. Um, so many options and ultimate freedom. Would you then say, uh, that's another question here from the audience, that are fashion designers then philosophers themselves? Uh, if, if fashion designers are philosophers? <laughs> yes. Uh, but sort of in the same way that everybody is kind of, a, uh, I mean, a, a, is kind of, a philosopher i mean the, the point being um that there's there's a way in which just the ordinary act of putting an outfit together no matter whether or not you you know think of yourself as styling it in this beautified um way just simply the process of sort of selecting and composing has an element of putting a world together um and in that way you know i think i mean benjamin talks about this that that designers are really like the, the sort of just to use a to use a line from um from Shelley that is totally out of context here. Um designers are sort of like the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Like they they alter the way that you think about, you know, um about the story of your clothes and especially fashion spreads in magazines. I mean, these are built on, mm -hmm. on storylines. It's never just clothes okay. like sitting there in a in a vacuum. It's always tied, you know, to um to some sort of campaign. Um, and that can be as as provocative as, you know, Donna Karen putting a, a woman in the Oval Office, also mm -hmm. modeling suits, <laughs> but but also sort of putting these, you know, seeds of um of semaphores in into the um the minds of of onlookers uh yeah no so i think that answers this question with yes <laughs> and uh fashion is about storytelling and the story of our lives of alternative stories right um there's one interesting question here and since we spoke about um highly fashion conscious um expressions such as the dandy but do you feel that as leisure uh, wear like skims and cancel culture, another modern phenomenon, represent a newly branded form of fascism? Hmm. Interesting question. Um, I wonder what, I'm not sure I get the first part as leisure wear like skims. I don't know if I, I know what skims are, but I, um, but I don't know if I, if I quite see how that's going with cancel culture um let me think for a minute i would interpret it as uh, a certain conformism uh okay yeah uh, yeah 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 i mean that is the sort of suggestion that i was making about a sort of conformity to a non-identity um or the sort of you know i mean reality tv gets it something like you know the sort of the emblem of a a figure that you that you deify that also sort of indicates total normality <laughs> like the, this extraordinary you know characters of ordinariness like youtube <laughs> youtube videos you know and then then the person that that does them becomes a superstar um uh i sort of think taylor swift is an example um mm -hmm. but i'm not sort of sure not positive about that um but reality tv definitely you know where um where it turns you know a sort of the ordinary figure of the everyday into a kind of idol um that i think definitely has the seeds of of fascism um in it uh 
which can be seen by a uh, by um uh you know past elections <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> certainly uh, so um and not, so i mean very interesting question um but um let's get back to you know those on the other end not the norm core but uh, the dandy and the punk um so you said a punk by any other name would smell as rotten is the punk diametrically opposed to the dandy in terms of fashion and sense right um yeah so this is a reference to another to another thing i wrote um about punk yeah i mean i think the dandy is a punk a sort of elegant punk um that you don't even see coming you know that it's like um you uh you wouldn't you know um in the 19th century sense you know the dandy is is precisely the sort of figure that that you don't see coming in the sense that he fits right in um and yet his sole purpose is this sort of revolt against the the social order or kind of transplanting himself into places where he supposedly doesn't um doesn't belong so it ends up being a kind of um elegant fuck you uh in a way that that i think punk is a much more dramatic in your in your face um kind of motion but they're doing this similar a similar thing i think uh, so i don't see them as opposed i think they're they're very similar stylistically different but philosophically uh very similar yes, and yes. you know punk has inspired high high-end fashion um for decades so sure, um yeah. Um, does the rational dress society still exist? Uh, my, so, so no, this was another slide I had. Um, the, there, if you Google rational dress society, you'll come up with the image of what was the rational dress society gazette. So this was like, you know, um, an account of all the things that, that clothes really should be, um, which is essentially, you know, no, like uncomfortable five inch platforms and like corsets that you can't breathe in and all this stuff um and uh but that's you know the 19th century rational dress society what i meant to sort of suggest is that the the move towards comfort is is like a reemergence of the <laughs> of the rational dress um society by another name um which is comfort sort of non-constrictive um yeah society uh, yeah, that does seem the modern and perhaps also gender neutral uh, version of the Rational Dress Society, which to some degree was actually a social movement, if I understand correctly, uh, in yes. liberating women in particular from uh, very impractical dress or uh, and thus, you know, uh, leading to greater freedom because you could do more things that were previously not uh, meant to be done by women uh, and such things, um, making things safer uh, in practical dress um, could kill. <laughs> so right, right, um, right. while uh, norm core or comfort wear athleisure uh, nowadays um, is perhaps more, uh, you know, the freedom from, well, also the freedom from thought or the freedom from having to represent a certain thing. Right, 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 right. Yeah. No, that's a good distinction to make. I mean, um, I mean, uh, yes. Um, any closing remarks you would like to impart? Mm. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, <Wait more> <laughs> I certainly feel extremely vindicated as someone interested in fashion, uh, but always with, a, you know, a slightly, um, uh, uh, with a sense of, of a guilty pleasure if engaging or, or to take an interest in fashion. Um, so now I know it actually guilty. is a deep, deep thought. Um, <laughs> so thank you so much, uh, Gwendolyn. Uh, um, as I said, uh, get the book. There are many more fascinating contemplations. Um, and, you know, I find a uh, very, very good uh, historical overview. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, thank you for attending um, the National Arts Club. Thank you.